Hi, everyone, and welcome back to week number two of a two-part interview that I'm doing with my friend, my dear friend, and brilliant marriage and family therapist, Carol Montgomery. So glad that you're with me again. I hope that you were able to uh, see our interview last week. Um, we're still doing our Colossians series. This, I think, is actually week number 12 in our series from the book of Colossians, but we've landed in a section where the Apostle Paul is talking about relationships and and uh, mental health uh, without using that term. And so last Sunday, and if you weren't here, uh, you, you may love to go back and catch last week's uh, message. Last Sunday, we interviewed Carol and Neil, her husband. Neil was a pastor for over 30 years, and with their combined pastoral and therapy experience, they just had some brilliant perspectives on mental health and how to approach COVID and anxiety and depression in the times that we're in. But um, but today we're talking about relationships, and Carol is the perfect person to do this. I know she's helped a lot of us from Grace Church. She's helped my family. She's helped me, and she's just brilliant and um, wise and fun and so smart. So, Carol, thank you for being here thank again. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me, and thank you for having me. I love my relationship with you, so thank you. <laughs> I love talking about therapy. I love talking to therapists, and I love talking about therapy. Even just the word is powerful. Um, in the book of Revelation, very end of our Bibles, in Revelation 22, 1, it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And then here it is. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And I love, first of all, just the image of heaven, the new earth. And, and there's this city and a river and these trees that produce leaves and the leaves have healing. But the word healing there is the word therapia. It's where we get our English word therapy. And I just love the imagery that the nations need therapy. People need help. We need um, counseling. Counseling is healing with words, and that's what the best counselors do. They use the power of words, and we all know the negative power of words. We all know how a, a word curse, you know, you're ugly, you're dumb, you'll never amount to anything, um, who could ever love you? We all know how words can cripple and damage a soul, and so it certainly makes sense that on the other side that if God creates through the spoken word, that life-giving words can liberate the soul. And Carol, you're so brilliant at that. I've had conversations with you where you just you just reframe something and just in using a different set of words, I'm seeing the situation differently. And it's so freeing and it's so um, liberating. But I, I want to just quickly read the text and then start turning this time over to you to... Uh, speak to us about relationships. Here's where we are in the book of Colossians. Uh, we've come to a section where Paul starts to list uh, sets of human relationships. And I imagine most or a lot of the people that see you are seeing you for relational issues. I mean, relationships can be the most life-giving or the most crushing parts of our lives. Yes. Do you think maybe half or more or? I would say more than half. Yeah, yeah definitely more than half. Mm-hmm. I would definitely say that. So people just, they're, they're hurting, they're stuck. What they're do I hurting, do? They're hurting, they're stuck. Um, they're, and they're just hard to negotiate. It's different if we're talking about boxes. You know, they're not going to mm -hmm. interact back or talk back. <laughs> but, but people are complex and yeah. tricky and beautiful and wonderful. And it's hard. Yeah. They affect us and we affect them. Yeah, sure. Well, let me just read the text and then I'll have Carol comment on each of these different groups and, and share some things that I'm sure will will help us. Um, in the verses we covered last week, the Apostle Paul talked about having hearts that are ruled by peace and being grateful people and having the right inner dialogue where we're speaking truth, we're not overreacting or underreacting, we're, we're healthy on the inside. And then he says this in Colossians 3.18, he says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. And we can certainly talk about what first century slavery meant 
um, in that context versus the way we might read this today. This would be more applicable to our employer-employee relationships um, than other images that this might evoke. Um, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongdoings, and there is no favoritism. Then again, it goes into masters, and we can apply this to our jobs. Masters, provide what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. So in just a few verses here, Paul kind of... Um, does a Gatling gun approach to human relationships, marriage, parenting, um, work environment, um, uh, how to relate up to our parents, down to our children, and all of those, like you said, are super complex and super challenging. But actually, I want to start with a group that's not listed here. Um, I'm actually really excited for you to just give us advice. Um, I, I've talked to a lot of counselors, and it seems like sometimes counselors— they're not as directive as sometimes I would like them to be. I've, right. I've even talked to you before, and you ask amazing questions. And sometimes I'm thinking, just tell me what to do. Right. And actually, before we get to this, why why are you like that? Like, why do counselors? It seems like there's a difference between counsel and giving advice. There is, and and we are trained to not tell people what to do. Hmm. So it's tricky. Um, so there is a time when we need to step in with our wisdom and our perspective, but we're supposed to very min very much minimize that um, and have this, yeah, we're all trained to let you generate the answers and help you find them, but don't give advice. That's more counseling. That's not therapy. Yeah. Okay. Is that because if, if I come up with it on my own, I'll own it more? Absolutely, you will. Uh, Absolutely. It's, an, it's intrinsic now. It's okay. not extrinsic. And that's going to be empowering. Yeah. So even though I may say something that you do take in, and that's yeah. empowering, it's much better if you yeah. generate it yourself. We had a few times, uh, Jessica and I, in our marriage, uh, earlier on in our marriage, uh, I'm sure I still struggle with it, but early on in our marriage, there were times when I would struggle with some pride and I was a young preacher and a young pastor. And I remember I was in a prayer time and I felt like God convicted me and showed me, you know, why do you keep saying things that way? It's just to make yourself look better. I went and told Jessica and she smiled and she goes, I've been praying that you would see that. Mm -hmm. And I, I realized if she had told me, babe, you're kind of, you're getting a little arrogant or a little cocky in this area. I don't know if I would have heard it. I might've been, mm -hmm. but, but for her to pray, and for me to hear it, um, I don't know. That's but, way more empowering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But of course, there are times when you need to confront or she needs to say, hey, right. time out. Um, right. Okay. But today, since uh, <laughs> I've got you captive audience here, I want you just to give us advice and, okay. and coach us. And so we'll start, though. There, there's a group of people left out of this passage, and that's single adults. Um, and Paul talks about singleness in other passages. In fact, Paul clearly shares, and Jesus seemed to echo this in places, that a single adult lifestyle can be a preferred lifestyle. If your life is devoted to following Jesus and maximizing who, you've, who you are and your gifts and your purpose, that singleness can be, one, it can be special, two, it can actually be a holy vocation. Right. Um, some people who are single feel that way. Some people who are single want to be married, and obviously... You know, if, if we had the crystal ball and we could predict the future, some people who are single today, they might be married two years from now. So the, the emotion of wanting to be married, it might be a non-issue next year. Some of us who are married, um, in fact, most of us who are married will be single again at some point. We'll lose a spouse. And so um, many single people will be a couple and many couples will be single again. But um, what would you say just to, when you talk to single people, is there any counsel that you give on how to maximize your singleness, whether it's six months or six years or a calling? How do you maximize that and encourage people in that stage of life? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, we, discontentment runs rampant no matter what kind of stage of life you're in or relationship you're in. So sometimes married people say, oh, to be single again. And then single people say, oh, to be married. It's that learning how to be content where you are is is really tricky um, and important. Um, 
one of my very best friends has been single her whole life. She was engaged at one point. It didn't work out. And it's just so beautiful to see how well she's done that. She, uh, she appreciates that it has opened her up to really design the life she wanted and that she's um, really good at serving and being involved in families, other families' lives and supporting friends. And, um, but there are times when it's been really hard. And especially as we age, what's that going to look like? Who's going to care for me? And, um, so there are some some things, but I think it is singleness is an opportunity to really design a life that's exciting. The, the sky's the limit when you're single. You don't have to answer to anybody. And um, yeah, I remember even Dave Ramsey saying sometimes being single is easier when you're doing trying to do a budget because you don't have to answer to anyone how you do it or spend or and it's sort of that way with your life too. Um, so if it is hard. And I will say that the loneliest people I've ever met aren't single. They are people in a wow. bad marriage. Wow. They are the loneliest people I've ever met. Wow. They feel trapped and they are lonely. Wow. So we can, we can make the best of any situation. That's a, that's a fascinating way to start the answer to that question is to start by saying, are, are you internally content? And this is such a silly comparison, but Jessica and I have just noticed over the years how quickly vacations come and go. You look forward to it forever and then all of a sudden your five days or your two weeks are just gone and you're back to real, real life. And we've realized to have a flourishing, exciting life, our life has to be good. We can't hang all of our hopes on a two-week vacation. And and so you have to have a little vacation in every day right. in a sense. And so you're, you're kind of saying the same thing because you may dream of getting married and then, oh my gosh, what? where am I? What happened? And um, didn't expect this. And I think really that scripture speaks to that. These are, these slaves probably are not in ideal situations, but it's saying work on yourself, you know, find contentment in who you are, what you're doing, who you really serve, um, and, and be about that. And so connecting to yourself and making that better makes no matter what kind of stage of life or situation you're in better. Yeah. Because that that advice would continue whether you move into a relationship or not. Right. You, you need to work on yourself, whether you're married or not. It's a dangerous thing to make my happiness dependent on you. So I've I've got to always be attending to that. What do you say to those people who are in a an unhappy marriage? So. Well, I ask them, first of all, if they can differentiate between a destructive marriage and an unhappy marriage. A destructive marriage is different than, than an unhappy marriage. And we always, I'm a big advocate for we answer to ourselves. When I go to heaven, God's not going to say, so how'd Neil do? As much as I'd like to say, hey, how about, did you remember this one? <laughs> He's going to be more concerned how I responded to that. And so whatever that was and vice versa. And so... Um, yeah, I, I would say first self-examine, look, change everything you can about your situation. So if my husband is complaining, I, I wouldn't do this if you would just stop. Okay, there's blame there. Yeah, but is there some truth to that blame? Do I need to correct a few things? Why don't I get about that and make things better for me? Um, so I would say take off the table their complaints as much as you can, um, the ones that are fair anyway and then, um, then move forward. If it's destructive, then we need to, I know we're gonna talk about boundaries, but, but we need to go that way. Well, let's, let's talk there a little bit right now. I mean, what, so from the perspective of somebody in the kingdom of God, meaning your life is oriented around Jesus, we're following in his steps, we're trying to conform to scripture, it would seem like an unhappy marriage is an opportunity for discipleship and clinging to Jesus and having him work in us and learning to serve and then hoping and believing and sowing into it getting better and getting happier. But that, but that would be different from something that's destructive. What is, what is the difference? So uh, an unhappy marriage, I mean, why is it unhappy? Is it because I'm unhappy? <laughs> Am I an unhappy person to be around? Um, what's, what's that like? And, or is my, is my partner unhappy? And is there something I can do to legitimately love well and better and more thoroughly in order to make that better? But the destructive stuff, that is, like you talked about at the front end, um, those words, you know, it, really domestic violence, we say, starts with um, name-calling. So it, it's, it's those kind of, it's the misuse of an um, abuse of power and control. And so when you're with someone who's very um, 
controlling and um, oppressive, that's now when it starts to get really destructive and we've got to negotiate that very carefully. Okay, so let's come back to that and um, give a little more clarity with that. But first, uh, even before we get into the more of the specifics of marriage and parenting, what are the marks of a healthy relationship? Because I, I want everybody to have a 10, but what is a 10? What does that look like? How do you, because we don't, we, we live in this world of, of fantasy, of, of right. um, unrealistic expectations, and yet a healthy life-giving relationship is awesome. So what, what are the marks of that though? Well, scripture, and some of the words you had just breeze that right out to us. First Corinthians um, 13, that's perfect example of what a healthy relationship is. So, but overall, and this is a word I'll probably say a lot of times during our time together today is respect. I just, the older I get, the more I realize how important respect is and how that manifests itself. So in those abusive relationships, those destructive relationships, there's not respect, there's control. So um, respect for self, self-respect, and respect for the other person. Um, and that provides trust. Now that builds trust, right? I trust you because you're respectful to me. Um, you're a safe place. I, I'm going to trust you with my emotions and my, my heart. Um, compromise would be another one. I think maybe that would be a version of dying to self at, at times, um, compromise. Um, and then problem solving, that, that's something that we look at things as a problem to be solved, not your fault, you need to change, but this is just a problem that needs to be solved. And I think attentiveness has now become a big issue because of those phones. Yes, I went there, <laughs> the phones. People are in the phones and they're not as attentive to each other anymore. These games are so engaging. I'm guilty of that. Um, or the social media or whatever it is that, um, so really that attentiveness. Uh, I, I have space in my head and my heart and my life for you and I'm going to attend to you and I'm going to do it respectfully and gently and well. That's so good. Let's go back to how you, the very first thing you said there, you said that respect produces trust. Mm -hmm. When you trust, you feel safe. Mm -hmm. And then would you also say that if you feel safe, that leads to intimacy? Oh, absolutely. In, yeah. in every level of, right. I trust you with my emotions, with what I'm feeling, my vulnerability, um, my affection. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty huge. Mm -hmm. And so respect is a powerful right force to leverage. I think when we read this and when it says wives submit to your husbands, husbands love your wives, I, I think really Paul is giving the same commands to husbands and wives. He, he's saying um, he, over in Ephesians, he told husbands, love your wives the way Christ loved the church, even to the point of going to the cross for her. And so it's easy to submit to somebody who gives their life for you. It's easy to love somebody who's respecting you. So it's this, it's a mutual circle of of submission and love fueled by respect. Right. I love that. Right. That's huge. Something else you'd ask me, you'd ask me at one point, is um, healthiness the same as perfection? Okay. And I would say it's the opposite, really. Oh, wow. um, that because also a healthy relationship has humility. Okay. And in order to have humility, you have to come to terms with your humanness, that you are human. I'm going to do things that hurt you and offend you, and I'm so sorry that I do, and I want to repair it quickly. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to feel guilty about it, and I'm going to want to repair it. And that's going to cause us to bond, especially if you can receive that. So um, so perfectionism, I, I hear word on the street is that we're going to be that way in heaven, but, <laughs> but not till then. Okay. And, and so just really embracing, I've got things to work on and I am capable of hurting you. I never want to do that intentionally. But if I do, um, with humility and gentleness, I want to move towards you and try and fix that. That's good. And even just your use of the word humanness and giving permission for humanness is very liberating. And so can you, let's go back to the singleness for a second. Can you just paint a picture of a healthy single adult, including the humanness? Because it doesn't mean you're totally happy being single if you want to marry. It, it could mean you struggle with those emotions and you feel loneliness. But what does a happy or a, a healthy single adult look like? And then what's a, a healthy marriage and I know you just told us respect but like what would how would that be fleshed out and then what does it look like to be healthy in an unhappy marriage can I still be healthy if my marriage is unhappy oh yes yeah that's a great question yes so as you're noticing the common denominator it common denomination is you it's it's, okay. it's who you are in all of these really in all these states of being so if it's if it's single, you know that person that they're just easy to be around. They're um, they're 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 at peace. You know that 
peace is ruling their life and you want to be around them and things are going well, doesn't mean every they're free from tragedies and the storms of life. They just negotiate them better because they have this kind of peace. And you can have that no matter what kind of relationship you are in or are not in. So a healthy single adult is not somebody who's totally happy every day. Correct. They're at peace. They may or may not want something different, but they're maximizing today. They're working on their stuff. When they feel emotion, they process it in ways that are yes. healthy. Yes. Kind of back to that check-in I talked about last week. They're, they're checking in, how am I doing today? You know, how, how am I feeling? Is there any... Is there any unfinished business or any ashes in the fireplace that need to be cleaned out, you know, of, of the day? And, and just doing that, getting to know yourself. How did I react? Am I happy with that? Would I like to do that differently next time? How can I grow in that? How can I learn to grow in that? Yeah. You know, it's all that pursuit. Yeah. Um, and I have to understand I'm human and yeah. I need to do that. I didn't just come yeah. knowing that. That's good. So I know you just told us that. A healthy marriage, it's based on respect, which produces trust and safety. But can you just say it differently? Give it, say it another way. Like, what would that look like? Is it, is it a consistent language of kindness? Is it gentleness? Is it serving each other? What? Yeah. So over time, Neil has taught me that I can come to him with something at work that I thought was really unfair or, you know, and, and he'll so stick up for me and say, oh, how dare that person? And, you know, he, he's on my side, he's on my side. And he's taught me over the years that he's on my side. So I've learned that's so respectful of my experience. He's not getting in the bulldozer and trying to change it all and fix it. I've taught him not to do that. (laughs) Um, But he, he's taught me that he's trustworthy with my heart on those kinds of things. And so I, I can go to him with that. That's, that's what I mean by that. If, and what's harder is when you're even frustrated with that person. So when I'm angry with him, is he safe for me to go with that? Or is he going to respond? Or am I going to respond if he comes to me with things? Am I going to be defensive or critical or accuse and, or flip it, you know, back to him? Um, those are the things that in the nitty gritty of life improve trust. And in, in, as, as you respect the things, your, your kids, your family, your coworkers, whatever, whatever they bring to you, and you take good care of it as if it's a delicate little ornament um, and you treat it that way, then trust is built. That's so good. So, so Neil is always on your side, even when you're wrong. Like say you're wrong with the situation at work. He's, so he might even have to help you see sometimes. He starts on my side. Start, okay. <laughs> starts on your side. And he, mm-hmm. But even if you're wrong, never leaves your back. Never. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, you, you just said something that's so good. It's just worth one more minute of camping out on when you talked about protecting and that safety aspect. Because uh, we're talking about marriage in this segment and that relationship is so vulnerable because Mm -hmm. nobody can hurt me as much as Jessica and nobody can build me up as much as her. And, and the nature of, of, of intimacy and it's so vulnerable to expose the depths of your soul. And, and even when we saw, you know, Adam and Eve in the Genesis narrative of being naked and unashamed, there's a, there's, it it takes a great level of trust and safety to Mm -hmm. really be that vulnerable. And, so I think that's just good language for us to, to have in our thinking of, of um, am I a safe place? Is anything I'm doing shutting them down? Because, right. um, yeah, that's impossible to have the romantic, fun side of life that you want if you're not right. safe. So what if I'm bringing those things and they're met with condemnation or criticism or anger? Um, it just says, no thanks, I'll go yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. So, okay, in light of that, real quick, remind us of those four horsemen of the apocalypse. Oh, I love those. John Gottman. Okay. (laughs) Um, Dr. John Gottman came up with these, and we see them now in communication books. We see them all over. It it was just groundbreaking, and he's so humble about it. He's saying, I learned these from other people, (laughs) showing him. So the four horsemen, um, if they're galloping around your relationship, chances are it's the beginning of the end, so we want to take them back to the barn. Um, (laughs) Criticism is, um, well, criticism is pretty self-explanatory, but it's a lot of accusing and um, you're doing it wrong, um, the kind of correction, um, sometimes that you don't want. The 
antidote to that um, criticism is bringing things up gently and maybe even saying, can I give you some advice on this or can I give you my perspective? That's respectful, isn't it? <laughs> um, defensiveness is a conversation killer immediately. As soon as I'm defensive, our conversation's going nowhere. It's self-protective. It's about me protecting me and me winning um, more than it is um, anything else. So the antidote to that is taking responsibility. Uh, I I can see how I was harsh in that. I need to take a look at that and apologize, whatever that might be. In the the worst one, I think, is contempt. So contempt is abusive. Um, contempt is criticism on steroids. So instead of saying you did that wrong, you shouldn't have done that, it's, it's saying you're an idiot. What a fool you are! I can't stand you. That, that's the the and it's it's mocking. It's eye rolling. It's a sense of superior or over the other person, and it also can be the silent treatment. Um, that's another really destructive way people stonewall. I've heard stories where parents haven't talked to their kids for two weeks, and those kids are a different person on the other side of that. They, it has so destroyed them. Um, so you can't do that. Um, and then the last one is stonewalling. That's when um, it looks like the silent treatment, but it's not. The person is shut down because they've been overwhelmed and flooded and they need a minute. And so if you can recognize that in yourself or in your, your person that you're talking to, whether it's a child or a, a spouse, give them a minute or say, let's take a minute. Let's revisit this a little bit later today. Let's work, crack a little joke at yourself, start, you know, de-escalate things so that we can... Um, yeah, but those are power, power, yeah. powerful tools. Sure, because there's a big difference between taking a minute or taking an hour to collect your thoughts and cool off versus silent treatment. Silent treatment yeah. is you're not worth right. engaging with right, right. now. Right, I'm so off. Yeah, you're so not human. So, just without the without the explanation, one more time. What are the just list those four? Criticism. Okay. Defensiveness contempt and stonewalling. Okay. And then if those things are actively at work in our relationships, it's bad news. Trouble. And so, There's trouble. so it's time to get help. Yeah. So, now yeah. we all have those. Okay. Um, the masters, he calls them the master couples. They don't have a lot of contempt every once in a while. They're not characterized by that, okay. but we all have that. They just have less of it. And so they correct it easily and That's quickly. Good. I always love that word characterized too, because we are not perfect. We're in process. So how are we characterized? You won't be totally gentle every day, but are you characterized by speaking the language of gentleness? Um, I love the verse in, in John 15, 1, in the NIV that I always teach from, it says, I am, Jesus is speaking, I am the true vine, my father is the gardener. Well, it's fascinating. In the King James Version, it says, I am the vine, my father is the husbandman. And we don't use that word in English anymore, but but husbanding actually is a gardening term, which so if I'm a good husband, not just Jessica, but if I'm that kind of a person in my life, everybody around me will be cultivated and cared for. And, and then Jessica's supposed to do that for me too. It's not a, it's not a, a husband wife thing, but, um, you're tending to each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's talk about kids. You started to go there about mm -hmm. parents that do the silent treatment. Give us advice for, okay, let's do this. Give us advice for parenting little kids, adolescents, and then we'll talk about dealing with aging parents. Great. Okay. So first thing I want to say is, I did it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I did so much wrong. <laughs> um, but I did pick up, the one thing I did do right is I picked up early on that respect piece and how powerful that was in our relationship. So when you think about it, when you, when a toddler's being so cute, and you, um, they do something goofy and you laugh at them, that's not really respectful. Sometimes you can't help it, um, but you really want to minimize that um, if you can. And the cute things they say, um, treat them like little people. And it's just so much more respectful. Now trust is built. Now you're a safe person. I notice that in my practice when I have little kids, the, the parent might be giggling away at something cute they're doing, and I'm just carrying on and, and talking to them like they're... Um, whatever they're doing makes sense to them. <laughs> so I want to be curious. There's that word we like. And I want to be curious about that and explore that. So I would say my number one advice to parenting is go at it approach with a respect. I know as parents we have to be in charge because they don't know better. and They don't know what kind of trouble. But we want to teach with respect. We want to. Um, and we do a lot of that on the front end, a lot of teaching and, and correcting. And we do that in a respectful way that's not humiliating. And then by the time we're at the teenage years, we want to talk less and we want to listen a lot more. 
And then I like, a lot of parents don't like this when I tell them this, but I say, ask for permission to give advice because now their heart's open to it. And um, otherwise they're, you're going to find you're, they're just defensive. Even when they're younger, like teenage years? Teenage years, okay. I would say, I, I just think they're going to come to you again. If they're, they're, they're over and over again, you're yeah. teaching them you're trustworthy and you're going to always treat them with respect. Whatever issue, it doesn't matter how small it is, you're going to treat it like it's, like it's as precious to you as it is to them. Now I'll come to you with anything. And that's what we want. Then I have a chance to speak into those things. I can't if I've, I've, yeah. I've, uh, well, we know when we, we know when our kids become adults, we're not micromanaging parents anymore. Right. We have to ask permission. But am I hearing you say, even when they're younger, even in those middle teen years, I'm still the dad, I'm still going to have to do what I think is right. But in the way of approaching them, I approach it through, can I, can, would you be open to some Right. Coaching. There are times when you have to draw that line. You yeah, have to say, sure. it has to be my way. I'm sorry, honey, you don't understand it. Yeah, yeah. You just got to trust me. You know, I, I haven't let you down yet, have I? You know, mm-hmm. that, that kind of thing. I, um, I know, but I think t- take the time to be curious about why what they're saying make, makes sense to them. They're holding fast to this point because it makes sense to them. And we've forgotten that, you know. So we have to go back to that. It makes sense to them. Let's find out why it does. And let them know we understand that and really explore that act of listening. What I hear you saying, oh, it makes sense now why you've come to that conclusion because of this. Now, may I offer my thing? That's good. This is so good for parents. Of um, As our kids are getting older, the they may have a relationship or something in their life that, that we don't approve of. And since we don't approve of it, mm-hmm. that's how we view the whole thing. This is bad. This is not right. And we, we're not curious. I'm not curious about why you want to do that. That's not good for you. Right. And yet I still have to respect them enough to find out why it's important to them right. in order to eventually help them. Right. Yeah? So is my fear ruling oh. it or is peace? Okay. <laughs> so, um, and it's hard. And you, no one's going to do this perfectly. It's it's just our goal. We're just going to try to try to do that and, and opt for those great conversations as much as we can. That's so good. Just, can you just clarify what you meant a few minutes ago when you said with our little kids, you want to be careful laughing at them? Would, would you say if if they're if they're being humorous, we laugh at them? Oh, with. We laugh with. We laugh with. Yeah. Okay, there you go. But you're, are you saying don't laugh at every little thing they do because they might be serious about it and then misunderstand? Or We might be embarrassing them. Okay. And, you know, that, I love that those little ones are so free to twirl around and, yeah. you know— do the things that they say, that the random things they do. We just want to encourage that for as long as we can because that insecurity comes just yeah, too soon. It, boy, it does. <laughs> so we want to just teach them to live and enjoy that freedom and um, just just really respect that. So sometimes laughing, it's not as affirming as we mean it. Correct. We don't know how they're interpreting that. We're, we're, we're saying we're superior to you and I'm laughing at you, you know, and that's not the message you want to give. So, of course, you want to delight in their darlingness, you know, if that's not a word, but <laughs> they are. They're so cute and delightful. Um, we just want to watch. Yeah. We just want to give that message. I'm delighting in you. I'm yeah. not laughing at you. I guess yeah. that would be where I would delineate it. Okay. And I know we're covering a lot of themes that could be seminars all in themselves, but um, to, to keep it moving, I just remembered um, I left one of my questions unanswered with you. Um, if somebody's in an unhappy marriage, so let's just reach back to marriage for a second, how do I stay healthy? Because I don't want that person to be my God, mm-hmm. and yet of course I'm affected, and of course they're the most e- affecting person in my mm-hmm. life. How does somebody stay healthy in an unhappy marriage while they're working on it? Okay, so um, we keep talking around boundaries. <laughs> so um, th- um, that's it, really, T- to understand that um, a boundary is the space outside of me and the space inside of me, and the boundary protects that. Okay. Um, so, and think of another way to look at it is if I have poor boundaries, I'm letting too much come in that's bad for me. If I have too rigid boundaries, I'm not letting enough good come in. But sometimes what's out there is not good, and it's harmful, it's destructive, it's hurtful, whatever it is. And I have to, from a good place inside, decide what I'm going to do about that and do it assertively and so, um, and, and in a healthy way. And sometimes, again, those boundaries are going to be more rigid and, or sometimes a little more loose depending on my safety with a person. Boundaries are for our best interest. Um, they keep us safe. They keep the other people safe. They're a corral um, that keeps the bad out and the good in. Um, 
So if I'm in a bad relationship, um, I remember I used this illustration with you and you really liked it at one point. It's, it's these two circles that if these circles are people, um, this is differentiated, okay. this is healthy, okay. the two circles that have a connection here, and then this is enmeshed. Got it. Okay. Sometimes in unhealthy marriages, um, they can be enmeshed mm -hmm. because I am so preoccupied with what you're doing and what you're up to and what's going on with you and how, and I'm just wrapped up in it and I've kind of lost myself in that. So what we want to do is get to healthy. I want to just be, be aware of what I believe in, my experiences, my virtues, my vices, my weaknesses, my strengths, what I believe, what I want, what I think, and how about you? Um, what do you think? And can we talk about that now? Otherwise, I might have to disengage from you a little bit because you, you won't stop doing these cruel, mean, harsh things. And so I might have to, in a positive way, differentiate myself and disengage a little bit in a positive way if possible. So I'm not doing that saying, I hate you, you're a terrible person, you have all these bad things. No, I'm going to positively detach and I'm going to say, I love you. Let's have dinner once a week, but I can't live with you because this is bringing me down and I have got to figure out how to handle the stress okay. and, and this particular preference you have because I'm not, I'm not doing, I'm going down with the ship here and I've got to figure that out. Um, so that, that might be a child, um, or adult child, a teenager, that kind of thing, or it might, might unfortunately be a, a spouse or a family yeah. member. So it sounds like a healthy boundary is not selfishness. Because we have to give ourselves away in relationships. Right. We have to serve. But a healthy boundary keeps us from being, you said, enmeshed, maybe codependence, another word. It's interesting that the book of Genesis begins with boundaries. God, When God brings order to chaos, it, it's this sequence of boundaries. And then even the garden itself had boundaries. And this river flowed here and that river flowed there. And and, and, bound, and then there's this, these trees you can eat from, this tree that you can't. And so boundaries are good. So what you're saying is a healthy boundary protects me to be as healthy as I can so I can relate in love mm -hmm. in the healthiest way possible. Right. Yeah. Much easier said than done. <laughs> Much easier said than done. Right. And a good boundary is good for both parties. Mm -hmm. That's the thing we have to remember is, um, yeah. Yeah, even though one of us may not think so, they are. Yeah. Okay, so part of why we're just shotgunning through all these issues is, is one, just to give a little snippet of counsel and coaching, but also if you're hearing this and you realize, wow, I am enmeshed in my relationship, I need help to be more healthy, then then these this would maybe be an impetus to get some counseling or to pursue that a little bit more. Let's just do a couple more. Um, back to that adult relationship, um, parents, like, an adult and their parents. Um, with seasons of life, we have little children, we have grown children, then we have adults that age. And so what's the top piece of advice you give to people to relate well with aging parents? Um, I think, back to respect, <laughs> how, how that looks in that season is remembering they need self-determination. Um, they've lived a lot of life. They are... Um, they believe what they believe very deeply and um, let them as much as safe call the shots in their own life, even though you may not agree with it. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, and then I think it's also important to let them experience consequences that they might need, just like it is the teenager. So let's say you have a parent who's um, very, very negative and you walk in and the complaining just starts let's say. So a boundary there would be, mom, I love you. I look forward to our time. The negativity is a little much for me. Um, you might not realize you're doing it. Could we move to a more positive conversation about, let's find some good things to talk about. I do want to hear about, you know, the aches and pains or the, your neighbors that are driving you crazy, but let's just do that for a few minutes and then let's move on to some different things. I think that's better for us. Um, now let's say mom says, okay, but then doesn't, then you might say, mom, you know what? I, it's still in that negative place. I think I'm going to go ahead and go home for today. I'll see you again tomorrow. I love you so much. You know, so we just begin setting those kinds of boundaries based on what you can tolerate and really what's best for her. Um, it's better for her to be in that better mindset. Hmm. That's good. My mother-in-law shared a metaphor with me once. Um, she and her, and her husband, my father-in-law, they had um, they were pruning a tree in their backyard, but it was an older tree, and they accidentally pruned it a little too deeply. 
And because of the age of the tree, it couldn't handle that depth of pruning. And she just was saying that, you know, hopefully we're all humble enough to always change and grow, but we do kind of get set in our ways. And it does seem like if you can gently prune a relationship, Mm -hmm. do it. But if if a parent has come to a place where they're not going to budge or they're too set in their ways, then you don't, you can't hammer away at it until you kill the relationship. Right. You set boundaries and so adjust. that, and adjust. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, let me have you just comment on two other things real quick. Um, talk to, any advice regarding midlife crises? Let's talk about midlife crises and menopause. So a couple of fun, fun things to end on here. Um, just, I don't know if everybody experiences midlife crisis. I don't know if some people are more prone to it. Yeah. Um, I don't either, but I do know through the lifespan, we change so much. Our body changes, our, our chemistry changes too much. We just change. And, and so come to terms with that. You know, again, that's a part about being human. I am, I am not the 21 year old I once was. And I, I don't feel, um, that way in a lot of ways. And, and I may have family members now that are commenting on that you know, mom, you've been a little harsh here, or you've been a little snappy, or you're just not, you know, if that's the case, if I'm getting that feedback, I need to have the courage to receive that. So, so it's coming to terms with and accepting that changes are coming. Sometimes there's some medical issues going on at that stage of life that need to be looked at. And we need to just be humble enough to say, okay, maybe I need to make some of those changes. But it's, it's back to contentment again. It's finding contentment in a new se- season of life, adjusting to a new season of life, not thinking the grass is greener elsewhere. It's not, has to be mowed, as they say, <laughs> um, and weeded and fertilized. <laughs> um, and I think it's really important that we just come to terms with that because life is changing, we also may need to make some changes, find a new contentment and learn, learn about ourselves in this time. That's so good. Uh, I'm I'm just now finishing up reading a book that I'm sure a lot of you have read. I'm sure you've read it. It's um Victor Frankl's book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Mm-hmm. He of course was in the concentration camps during World War II, and he was a psychotherapist. But he his whole message is that is that um, without purpose we just wither up and die. And mm-hmm. it seems like a lot of midlife crises, it's a crisis of purpose. Mm-hmm. But it sounds like you're saying that the answer to that is an inside job. It's not looking for it out there. So it would come back to who are you? Mm-hmm. Who am I in you? Mm-hmm. And instead of clinging to 21 when I'm not 21 anymore, how do I be a brilliant 50 mm-hmm. or a brilliant 65? Mm-hmm. Is that what? Yeah, you have new things to offer now and new purposes to find. And just because it looks different doesn't mean it isn't better. You know, there's, I just think God is leading you to those great fields and, um, Maybe we go kicking and screaming, but they're they're really good there. So let's let's let ourselves be guided there and do the work we need and solve some problems along the way, make things better. Design a life you love at any age. That's good. That's good. Okay. In winding down, just make a comment uh, regarding the stage of life that women inevitably come to of going through menopause. You know, I, I feel like we always hear about, you know, trying to help young people become adults, but we don't really talk about the other side of it of that's a pretty major life transition. Yeah. And do, do you, is that it's a crisis like, for women? Is that a, It can be. It's okay. so, it's so different for everyone. Some okay. women are like, yeah, I barely noticed it. You know, <laughs> God bless them. <laughs> Good for them. Okay. Um, the rest, you know, there's the other women <laughs> dealing with the, the, the other things that come with that. And, um, but I guess that's what I was thinking about when I was saying, um, about the midlife crisis. If you're getting feedback that you're not the same, that, um, there's something different about you learn all you can. There's so many good books out. There's great doctors on this. There's supplements. There's all kinds of lifestyle changes that can make this better. But it's it's easy when you're not feeling well to think it's if everyone else would just change. You want to make changes inside by orchestrating change outside. And it just doesn't work like that. So that's one of those major changes going on inside. It's going to affect it, how you relate, how you feel, how you think. And um, become a student of that and make it better. It's yeah, it's rough. It's rough for some people. Okay. And what you said is so good and applicable in so many areas. Of If you're getting feedback that you're changing or you're different, not every bit of criticism that somebody gives you is right because people view us through their own lenses and biases. But if you're getting consistent feedback that you're consistently different, we should listen to that. And, um, and I realize that we didn't get into talking here about Paul's thing about um, servants and employers, but the principles would would apply. Um, 
you know, respect, protecting yourself, all of those same principles apply. I wish we could dive into that, but let's let's do this. One final word, either for millennials, Gen Z, um, and I know they're different, but just the young young people emerging in today's world. As you counsel them, what are you what are you saying to them? Is there a consistent message that that, that we need to hear at that age? Um, one thing I find myself saying a lot is, "I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm really sorry," because we are so different from you. We were trained differently. We think differently. And there's so many things you're right about. And we have to have the courage to listen to your perspective and understand how you feel about things. And I'm asking you to be patient with us. And some of us are so stubborn and so set in our ways and so entrenched in our doctrines and uh, dogmas that we can't really see what it is or hear or be curious about what you're saying. But if you can, be patient with us while while we do that. And I want to ask you... um, to, to try to understand, um, I love how accepting you are of everybody and everything. You've learned that. You've been trained that. We were trained and taught very differently. We're learning that. Um, we have a lot to learn from you in that. But if you could um, be patient with us, too, you feel differently about authority than we do. Um, you're very equal. Everybody's equal. And we believe that in value. Um, everybody is definitely equal in value, but we do believe in in authorities. Um, and so I'd like you to think a little bit, could there be some truth to that? And um, let those authorities, those good authorities teach you um, would be kind of my wow. advice there. That's awesome. Do, do you have any final thoughts? Because um, I'll probably have to end it here, but anything that you've been wanting to say that, that I moved you past too quickly or any closing words? Um, I don't think so. I think if I could sum it all up is just be aware of how the way, if you're getting feedback over and over again, that you're a certain way, pay attention to that. Um, cause you can change that. And, and, it, and that will affect all your relationships, coworkers, roommates, spouses, children. You want to be someone that people can approach because especially if you have, the hope of Christ and the message of salvation in you, you want people to feel safe enough to approach you with that too, as well as with their heart. And so I would say just keep striving to be respectful and that safe place for people. So good. So good. And every single thing that Carol has said is embodied in the life and the person and the ministry of Jesus. Everything. The way he approached people was was laced and fueled with respect. He he loved until there was no more room to love, but there were also parts of, and moments when it said that he didn't fully commit himself to a person because he knew what was in that person. So he loved unconditionally, but he was willing to hold a boundary for the, the greater good. He, he related in gentleness. He was willing to speak truth. I mean, everything that we're after is found in the person of Jesus. And so that's also just an amazing... Uh, piece of counsel is right here on our own scriptures of we're watching the reality of this lived in the person of Christ. And we have the Holy Spirit. So it's more than just willpower trying to do these things. It's asking God, the spirit in us, empower us and show me and help me. And so um, let's go for it. Let's create brilliant, beautiful lives, whatever stage of life we're in. And Carol, thank you. This is such good stuff. And if any of you want a referral for counseling, um, we're partnering with several counselors and we can possibly uh, find somebody to help talk to you. You could talk to me or our staff at, with certain things too. Um, but I love you and I love all of you. God bless you. We'll, we'll wrap it right there. See you next week. Bye-bye.